All right, we're going to get started on our second panel, and we're going to shift our conversation from U.S. aid to the other tools that the U.S. has at its disposal to focus on jobs, economic growth. Um, and I'm delighted to introduce our moderator for this um, discussion, David Rothkopf. David is a visiting scholar at the Carnegie Endowment. He's also president and CEO of Garden Rothkopf. And we are particularly excited to ha have him on this panel because he blends um, government service, private sector expertise, um, and an insider view of Washington, how it works. He's the author of a very famous book on the National Security Council. He was a senior uh, international trade official in the Clinton administration and has extensive experience in the private sector. Um, and I also wanted to say a special thanks to our last panelist, Assad, who is here from Pakistan. Um, when Ren, Nancy, and I took a trip recently to Pakistan, we met with dozens and dozens of people in Pakistan. I think my conversation with Assad was the single most interesting and useful conversation I had, and I thought instantly, I, I really need this person to, to talk to Washington. So we were delighted he happened to be here, and for anyone in the audience who works at the State Department, thank you for granting him his visa at the final moment. <laughs> and I also want to say a special thanks to, um, to uh, Rob and to Masood, who are our members of our study group, and Rob, in particular, really gone above and beyond the call of duty and really leading the effort to try to get this administration to do more on trade um, and to get Congress. So I really wanted to point out uh, Rob's service to that. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. In the interest of encouraging an even livelier discussion for this second half, I'm going to take off my jacket, um, which always stirs things up. Uh, let, me, let, let me also um, uh, provide brief introductions uh, to each of the panelists, as I've been requested to do. Uh, Masood here, who was also referenced a moment ago, is the IMF's director of the Middle East and Central Asia Department. Uh, uh, Rob is the chairman of the Mossbacher Energy Company, of, uh, formerly ran OPIC. And uh, Assad is the president of Engro Corporation Limited. Um, now, it, uh, you've been talking about this remarkable report in, in many of its uh, dimensions thus far, and it's, and it's, it's clearly an achievement. Uh, one of the achievements, I think, that uh, may, have, may have gone unnoted thus far um, is the, 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 the amazing feat of producing a credible report that begins, we urge Congress to display humility, patience, and clarity of mission, <laughs> um, <laughs> which is certainly a, a reach. Um, now. Going, going beyond that, uh, the, the purpose of this panel is to focus on the non-aid measures um, that can be used to good effect uh, with regard to advancing our interests in Pakistan. Um, based on some of the exchanges that I've had thus far, though, I think what I'd like to do um, perhaps is to begin with Assad and to ask you the question, why should we be talking about non-aid measures in the first place? Thanks, uh, Nancy and, and Molly, for inviting me here. Uh, and, and the rest of you can relax, because I'm going to give you my sanitized version of my views and not the ones that uh, Molly heard when she visited Karachi. Uh, OK. In, in, that, in, that sound you hear is disappointing. <laughs> in terms of uh, why non-aid, because uh, frankly, that's the only thing which matters. Uh, with, with all due respect, uh, aid makes very little difference to Pakistan's economy. And just to put it in context, uh, the disbursements that took place this year uh, are add up to something between 0.2 to 0.3 percent of Pakistan's GDP. Uh, so if you're expecting Pakistan's economy to be transformed uh, as a result of these flows, or even when they go all the way up to the one and a half billion dollars a year, uh, it will still be less than 1% of Pakistan's economy. Uh, as opposed to that, foreign direct investment uh, or total foreign investment just three years back in, in Pakistan, the year 2007-2008, uh, exceeded seven and a half billion dollars in a single year. That's, that's more than what Kerry Luger bill aims to disburse over five years. Uh, and this was world-class MNCs across sectors, uh, unfortunately very few of them American. Uh, and, and really that's, the, the, that's one of the two most powerful things uh, that, that can happen for Pakistan's economy. 
It's a capital stopped economy. It's got low investment and savings rates. And because the savings rate is so low, even the relatively low investment rates are difficult to sustain without creating current account deficits. Uh, and, and therefore, investments coming in can play a significant role and have played in our, in our past a significant role. Uh, the U.S. investments have, uh, have tended to decline over a period of time. Uh, the Middle Eastern investors have become much more significant. China is starting to become a much bigger investor. Uh, so that's one significant piece. The other, of course, is trade. Uh, uh, you have seen uh, more people, uh, hundreds of millions lifted out of poverty in the last 50 to 60 years in this world than ever in the history of mankind. And almost all of that has happened on the back of, of trade. Uh, in there also, uh, perhaps the role that the U.S. can play is less significant uh, than the other options available to Pakistan. Uh, how many countries in the world share their border? with not one but two of the biggest, fastest growing economies in the world. So the trade uh, that we should be concentrating on is the trade with India and China. Uh, but still, the US economy continues to be the biggest economy in the world. Uh, and therefore, having greater trade access to the US uh, can play a very significant role. And, and between these two levers, uh, trade and investment, uh, it will dwarf the impact of any uh, aid that's going to go into Pakistan. OK, thank you. Now, I think to put that into some context, let me turn to Masood. And, and ask, you know, from the perspective of the IMF, uh, where are the, the, the greatest needs within the economy? What's the situation in the economy? And I think, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's worth noting this is the second toughest question, no matter how fraught the economy is within Pakistan, that I could ask, because I could also ask you to solve the problems of the IMF. And um, unfortunately, we only have limited time here, so we have to focus on one of those issues. Thanks, David. So I think if you look at the economy in Pakistan now, um, it may be useful just to divide up the short term and then the medium term. So short term, let's take the next year. Uh, next year, I think in some ways uh, the economy is actually doing better than many people had anticipated a year ago, particularly on the external side. <clears throat> so current accounts doing better, uh, export prices are up because of cotton prices, remittances are up. That's the, actually the, the other flow other than uh, trade and investment. You know, they're running at about a billion dollars a month now. So you have those positive factors on the one hand. On the other side, the sort of domestic balances, particularly budget balances, are all going in the opposite and wrong direction. So you now have a uh, expenditures running ahead of income, probably about six, six and a half percent of GDP, which you know, in other countries you can run six percent budget deficit if you've got good ways of financing it, but you don't have a good way of financing it in part because aid flows are low. So you're basically printing money, it's going to put pressure on inflation. So what you see is no immediate crisis in the short run, but a buildup of vulnerabilities. And the big vulnerability is that the fiscal numbers are progressively getting out of track. I think I, I consider it sort of like a freight train, you know, running through billion dollars a month of a budget deficit for a $180 billion economy. Every year you add $12 billion to your debt. And it's just not a sustainable long-term uh, strategy. Now, it's, then you say, okay, but come back to the medium term. If you look at the medium term, Clearly, the big issue in Pakistan is how do you get out of this low growth equilibrium? You know, you're currently stuck at two and a half, three percent growth this year. If you're lucky, you get up to about four next year. You need two, two and a half times that growth rate to generate the kinds of jobs that you are going to have to generate for a young and growing labor force. And uh, to do that, you get into I would approach the issue not so much from what the rest of the world can do to help foreign direct investment or trade, but what is it that's holding growth back? You know, a bunch of people sitting in this room who have done work on this issue. The economics and the constraints are, are not that complicated. If you look at a simple technical level and say, what's holding up growth rates in Pakistan? You can make a list of things. You say it's low investment, it's the business climate, it's the skill set of people, it's the fiscal uh, imbalances that are pushing it, it's the governance framework. Energy is a big issue for the short run. I mean, if I were to worry about one single issue, which I think is the equivalent of the sort of Arab Spring trigger in Pakistan, is the fact that people are now putting up with 10 to 12 hours a day of electricity shortages and 45 degree temperature Celsius. And that's what's going to bring people out on the street more than lack of jobs, lack of education, governance, corruption. This is what's really driving a lot of people now. 
The issue, I think, is a political economy problem. Why is it that when the technical analysis on almost every aspect of Pakistan's economic management and the constraints to growth has been done over and over again, over many years, by very many competent people, why is it that we are unable as a society to come to grips with addressing those constraints? And I think if there's a discussion to be had, it's actually to start a debate about what kind of economic model does one want to have? Do you want a large state or a small state? So for 40 years, people have been saying that Pakistan ought to have a, uh, a much higher tax to GDP ratio, spreading around 10%. It's been around 9 to 10% for 20 years. You know? And people don't, we don't manage to get it up. And the reason it doesn't get up is because there is no real societal consensus on the need to raise more money and spend it. The, the feedback loops that would go from issue identification to implementation of solutions is the one that's broken. And so I think actually increasingly the work that needs to shift now is to shift away from more analysis of the technical nature of the problems to more discussion about the political economy of reform and what are the appropriate feedback loops that would go from problem to solution. And that's where I think Asad uh, Umar uh, and the other people on the business council, the private sector has really not been a big player in, in pushing for a coherent approach to an, inter, uh, an economic strategy in historically. And I think this is a terrific initiative to actually start building pressure points for first defining a narrative of what is the economic strategy and, and core imperatives on which people agree, and then pushing for changes in that direction. So my two-bit worth on this is enough already with the technical analysis. Uh, we have a lot of good ideas, but let's start to see what are the feasible feedback loops that will help us move from identifying those constraints to actually building a consensus around solving them, and at what level those solutions will occur. Will it be at the local level, provincial level, federal level in different areas, using the private sector, using private-public partnerships. I think that's where I would like to push uh, a bit more of the discussion, maybe even Good. today. Well, well, we'll come back to that. But let me ask you one question before I get to Rob, who I'd like to sort of have flesh out some of these, these initial recommendations in the report. Um, Nancy talked earlier about the long term and the importance of thinking long term. You talked a little bit about short term and, and, and in medium term. But when you talked about energy, you said, well, this is a potential fault line issue. This is a potential trigger for unrest. And clearly, one of the reasons for US and other aid programs is to maintain stability. Other, you know, in, in the case of the Arab Spring, food prices were a trigger for unrest. And there's a lot of sort of pressure on global commodity prices right now. Would you see that as another potential trigger for short term unrest that ought to be addressed? And uh, more broadly, what short-term triggers that have you know, strong economic components should also be kept in mind beyond just the energy? I'm sure people around in the room have uh, their own perspective on this. I, my own view is that I don't think it's food prices per se, but it's inflation more generally, which is becoming more of the social trigger. Because you know, it's been stubbornly high at uh, you know between 10 and 15 percent and uh when you break down half of almost half of the cpi is basically kind of food and basic commodities so this a lot of it is coming from food prices but i think what most people are feeling is the pressure of this consistent rising inflation income not keeping up with it so it's a combination of that which i would say is the other uh, big driver of unrest now Rob, you were part of the team that put the, the, this report together, and, and it's interesting and I think salient to the overall message of the report that the, the first two recommendations from a policy perspective were focused on trade and investment as opposed to on aid. Maybe you could explain a bit of the rationale behind that and why you think that's important. Well, I think first uh, there's a growing recognition that sustainable development is not possible without a good, strong uh, economic base that's driven by the private sector and that builds a good middle class. Uh, so just as an objective, I think, uh, and, and comparing the figures that Assad was talking about in terms of 
of uh, OD uh, official development assistance versus what can be driven by the private sector. Then we looked at, well, what's possible in the short term? And, and uh, institutions like OPIC can help mitigate risk, but you, you simply can't finance a significant power project if there's a history of the off-takers not paying their bills. So they have this unfortunate sort of dark cloud hanging over Pakistan of five, six, four, I don't know what it is, but it's too much, of so-called circular debt. This is unpaid uh, obligations from previous commodity price increases. So the Pakistanis have to decide to deal with that themselves to facilitate an environment in which new investment will take place. And when they do, I think institutions like OPIC and the IFC and others will take, uh, will, will be willing to share risk on investment. Uh, what we did come to was those things we thought we could do, or at least the United States could support, that would have significant economic impact and did not require significant reforms in the short term. And first and foremost among those is to help Pakistan expand its exports. Now, I, I always defer to people who work on Capitol Hill about what's practical, but uh, there isn't a single thing in really? terms of practical, in terms of doable politically. Uh, there isn't a single thing that we uh, saw that would have as much impact on employment uh, as well as actually uh, creating positive momentum towards potential reforms than to uh, enable Pakistani exporters to have greater access to the U.S. market. Specifically, the report recommends duty-free, quota-free access to the U.S. market. Uh, for Pakistani uh, exports for five years. The largest piece of that would be textiles and apparels. And the immediate question is, uh, is that possible and what impact would it have on the U.S. market? There's been a wonderful analysis uh, done uh, here by Kim Elliott, which is a, a separate piece of literature, but I would commend to all of you, which tries to analyze uh, the impact of providing duty-free, quota-free access for textiles and apparels uh, from all of Pakistan as opposed to a limited region of Pakistan, which was previously described under the Reconstruction Opportunity Zone legislation. And the conclusion was it would have negligible impact on the U.S. market. It could uh, influence some relationships between U.S. textile and apparel people in Central America, but those if you look at the history of the Haiti trade bill, those things are manageable. They can be financed. So bottom line, we said first, let's help expand exports. Textiles and apparels would be great. Labor costs in China are rising. There's a lot of capacity that's prepared to move elsewhere. Pakistan would be a great place to pick up a lot of the slack, make it countrywide. Uh, and second, let's increase opportunity for investment, both foreign direct investment, if we can, as well as uh, Domestic investment and can, OPIC can, I can help with that. A question in yeah. there? Because you said, is it possible and what would the impact be? And you dealt a little bit about the impact. But of course, the question is, is it possible politically um, in the context of the United States right now, both sort of post the Osama bin yes. Laden raid and also with sort of prevailing attitudes towards trade being what they are, when it's very difficult to get done small deals with benign, you know, essentially negligible economic forces out there in. in I, I would say under normal circumstances, and, and that's even without bin Laden, without the Raymond Davis case, it would have been very difficult. In this environment today, it's impossible. But that does not mean it's impossible in a month from now or two months from now. And what it's going to take is absolutely uh, unconditional support and leadership from the White House. They have to decide this is a strategic imperative that is absolutely critical to the economic development of a country where we're not going to spend uh, significant new dollars. So I think it's possible if it's a bipartisan effort, if it's re recognized as a strategic imperative and not uh, just so much a trade initiative, and then if you get down to the specifics of actual impact on the textile producers uh, in the United States, uh, I think we can identify that, manage it. Okay. And then you're going to go on to the, the investment side? The investment side would be more, again, there's uh, the report recommends uh, a enterprise fund, which is an idea that's being kicked around in a lot of places, uh, but probably an easier sell uh, would be just simply to expand OPEC's capacity. And that would come primarily from expanding their uh, credit subsidy, which is basically what they use to reserve against uh, higher risk loans. Um, OPEC has been very committed uh, for years to Pakistan. Uh, they can do more 
And I think it's being recognized today that OPEC has enormous capacity on a, on a non-budgetary basis uh, to play a major role. So if you look at what made up most of the economic package the President announced for Jordan and Egypt and Tunisia, it's about half debt relief and about half OPEC loan guarantees. So OPEC could do more of that with some more credit support to increase its risk appetite. Okay. Um, now, I'm going to um, uh, open this up to questions from the floor in just two minutes or three minutes. So if you have questions that – well, I see you have one. So just, 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 just give me one second here. Um, because I'd like to go to one last question to Asad. Because in the last panel and in this panel, you sort of circle back on a regular basis to refrain, Pakistan has to do it for itself. Pakistan has to lead the way to these reforms and so forth. And yet, of course, many of them haven't been forthcoming. And I'm just, I mean, you, I, I don't know you, uh, but we, you've been introduced as a man of great candor. Um, uh, and so <laughs> what, I, what I'm hoping is an unvarnished, for, for is an unvarnished look at what is actually possible in terms of what Pakistan can do for itself over the foreseeable, the next year or two. Well, f first of all, uh, is that necessary and is that something that should be happening? Absolutely. That's that's the only way we're going to have uh, a sustainable uh, reform taking place when it is a homegrown effort uh, and not coming out of Washington, D.C. Uh, what stops it from happening? Uh, well, part of it is uh, nothing specific to Pakistan. That's the way elites operate all over the world. You don't give up your privileges uh, unless you're forced to do so. Uh, and uh, the Pakistani elite is trying to hang on to its privileges, uh, which take either the form of uh, financial reward in, 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 in terms of not paying their due share of taxes uh, or control over uh, large swaths of the economy. Uh, but what makes Pakistan uh, not unique, uh, but, but different from a lot of other countries, is that one of the reasons why this goes on uh, is because of what people on this table do. Uh, it, it, if, if IMF and, and the U.S. government would not keep on bailing out the Pakistani elites, uh, the chances of reform would increase. Uh, it's no surprise at all, uh, Masood was referring to the efforts that we have been making. We've engaged with all the top political leadership of the country over the last four months. Uh, we put together a reform agenda, no rocket science to it. Any sensible person can put that together. But we've been engaging with the political elite, uh, the, the the party in power, the government in power, as well as the opposition, uh, and, and trying to sell a reform agenda. Uh, simple things, uh, tax reform, uh, energy system uh, reform, uh, trade, uh, particularly regional trade with India, and so on and so forth. And, uh, and, and it's no surprise at all that they've certainly started to at least listen to us. Why are they doing so? Because it's now been 12 months since the last tranche of the IMF uh, assistance was stopped. And, and, and every, I can assure you right now, if the next tranche goes through, uh, you will see this conversation taking a back seat. Uh, I, and, and I realize it's, uh, it, it's sitting from here in, in Washington, D.C. That's a scary thought, uh, trying to play uh, Russian roulette with, with a country like Pakistan. But trust me, these, these, the, the elite of the country are rational players. They're not irrational people. And, and, and they know when, when uh, it, it's time to, to, to give up and compromise. Uh, they do that all the time in the negotiations uh, with, with, the, with the international powers. Uh, and, and they'll know how to, when it is time to compromise with the domestic players. Uh, so there is a movement starting to take place in there. The other thing is, which is new this time around, uh, is that the lack of stability of the political system has meant that the intellectual elite of the country now, not as opposed to the political uh, elite, has never engaged with the political process. They found it too dirty, too messy, uh, and, and therefore just, just stepped back and just waited for the next time the army is going to take over and clean up the mess. Uh, as the realization is sinking in with the parliament in its fourth year and seeming to be headed towards completing its term, the intellectual elite of the country for the first time is saying, these guys are not up to it, and we need to engage, and we need to do something to change. So, so a lot of positive things are happening just beneath the surface right now. Okay, I see a bunch of questions, and since you were first, I'll give you a shot here. But let's let's try, as David said, to keep them questions and to keep them fairly brief. Uh, Taha Gaya with the Pakistani American Leadership Center again. Uh, my question is for uh, Asad Omar, and that's we've seen several 
American companies actually do quite well in Pakistan, whether it's Procter & Gamble or Pizza Hut. But somehow there's been a complete failure of marketing Pakistan as an investment destination to other U.S. companies. Uh, and I think the private sector in Pakistan can play a huge role in that. In fact, even when we're talking about you know trade access for Pakistani exports, I think if the private sector were, getting, were to get involved, not just relying on the government of Pakistan, but actually you know engaging with lobbying firms here uh, in the U.S. and actually lobbying for those textile you know, increases in, in market access for textile products and other products, I think we might actually get some concessions. And, and it, just this whole thing of having the private sector being engaged proactively and not leaving it up to the government of Pakistan to uh, make headway because you guys are, are competing globally. You guys are with it. Maybe the government of Pakistan is a little more bureaucratic, bureaucratic a little bit more slow moving. Uh, can't really get it done. So Okay. Is it, is, is it... Is, that, is it an oversimplification to say this is a failure of marketing, or is it because people leave their televisions on and they see the news? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you know, at the, yeah, at the Pakistan Development Forum, which takes place every year with the fund and the bank and all the bilaterals there, uh, there was a panel discussion with the private sector, and I was on that panel, and somebody got up, and uh, our company has been investing heavily in the last three or four years. We've invested $1.7 billion uh, in just one company in the last four years. Uh, and this guy got up, and he says, you know, this is wrong with Pakistan, this is wrong. He went through the whole laundry list, and are you crazy? Why the hell are you investing? Uh, <laughs> and, and, and the answer is very simple. Uh, the risks in Pakistan are real. That's not just projections by CNN. That, those, that's the reality of Pakistan. It's a high-risk destination. But the rewards compensate you for the risk given. Uh, you go and invest anywhere, in, or most of the Middle East, in, in a uh, power project, and you should expect a 9 to $10% dollar return. That's the IRR that you would expect to make. In, in Pakistan today, you are being offered for, for the development of the third coal field a sovereign guarantee-backed, guaranteed return of 20% dollar. So there is return to be made, therefore, while not downplaying the, the challenges in the Pakistani economy, there are tremendous opportunities available. Uh, those opportunities are being uh, taken up, less so in the last couple of years, and that's entirely uh, our own fault with the way we've been managing our economy. But otherwise, uh, a lot of foreign investment has been coming into the country. Uh, the country. It hasn't happened from the U.S. And I think the, the political atmosphere in Pakistan is so seen through that FPAC lens and, and what's happening on the political front, much more so than the rest of the world. And I think that has influenced uh, the way U.S. business thinks. And, and the bottom line, your, uh, the, that the private sector has a bigger role to play, absolutely. I completely agree with you. We haven't done our job. Yes, sir. Uh, so I'm an economist. I work on entrepreneurship. In, oh, uh, uh, Flowers World, George Mason University. I work on entrepreneurship and innovation. And like most of the people in this room, I'm fairly new to working on Pakistan. Um, I am so pleased to hear your uh, remarks, Asad Umar. You've restored my sense of my own sanity. Uh, I look at this uh, world, which, as I say, is a new one to me. And I see the, uh, the conversation almost entirely through the fear lens. Uh, the fear lens has its own interests in the United States. We talk about entrenched interests in Pakistan, but we have intellectual interest and, 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 and also economic interest in the United States. They're very invested in the fear lens. Um, and that's the, the, that's the way the conversation is entirely situated. My one and only trip to Pakistan, which was in the fall under the sponsorship of the Planning Commission, I saw a country that looked a lot to me like, like Beijing, where I lived in 1986. I saw a country that's about to completely take off, that's an incredible opportunity. I also see a country, statistically, where there's one-fourth the violent deaths in Pakistan that there are in Mexico, uh, just over the border from San Diego. So when we talk about Pakistan's a dangerous place, why don't we think about our own country? The, the point is that uh, when when, when we look at this entire discussion, I think what you're saying sounds so sensible. We haven't heard the word entrepreneurship one time. Uh, entrepreneurship is the force, exactly as Robert Mosbacher said, distributes uh, economic power, and that leads to real political transformation. And last point on this is this, this notion that, that aid and all of the things we've been talking about can actually be a detriment by helping to entrench the exact processes that keep a society from moving forward. It's not just a question of marginally improving it, it's a question of trying to phase it out. So um, I just uh, wanted to make that point. Thank you for your remarks. My question is, where is the exit? Where is the exit for the fear lens 
for the aid lens and where do we begin to uptick the opportunity lens so we can begin to communicate to the american public that in order for the united states to remain relevant in the twenty first century we have to engage with partners like assad and participate in the growth of the global economy and not be overwhelmed by these fears that are really marginal on the global scale Masood, do you want to respond to it just so we mix it up a little bit here and then we can well, I'm not sure it's a response so much, uh, because I think that a lot of what you've said, you know, is important to put on the table, that we need to start looking at opportunities as well. as I, I would maybe just make two small points. One is that I think that the point us have made is that, you know, you do see that the, the risks that are out there are real risks. They have to be evaluated. They have to be managed. So you don't need to be sort of awed by the fact that there are risks because there are returns to it. But at the same time, think about what that's saying in terms of the cost of capital that would, you know, you're paying. Instead of having to pay 20% to get a, a coal field developed, you could reduce that cost a lot uh, and get quite a lot more done if you could bring the risks down. So in a way, part of the agenda is how do you bring the risks down so that you can actually offer people a decent return for the lower risk that they're carrying. And the second point I'd make is that I think it, it's an interesting debate about how in the short term and in the long run, the the presence of aid helps or hinders the process of entrepreneurship, self-reliance, development, and it's, it's a big topic. And, and to my mind, you know, still you can argue it both ways. The important thing, perhaps in the case of Pakistan, is that even when periods, even if you look at the process of reform during periods when aid flows were much lower and there wasn't the same active engagement, you don't really see that the dynamics of internal reform were radically different. So I think you probably need you know, a long horizon to, to answer this definitively. I'm not convinced that the volume of aid alone is going to be the explanatory factor in terms of changing the domestic political dynamics. So I think you have to kind of go beyond that. Right. David, just add one point on that. Okay. Um, entrepreneurship really lives and breathes on equity and, and some debt. And when you have effective interest rates in the high teens uh, and sovereign paying better than non, it makes it very difficult to finance projects. I think there's enormous potential throughout that country, enormous. And, and what's more, as Nancy has said several times, the human capacity is there for much of what you want to do. Uh, but there are these impediments. Well, let me ask a question to any one of you, and then we'll, we'll go back to this. But it, it follows off of this. One of the things that distinguishes uh, trade flows and investment flows um, traditionally is that they're sort of over longer term and they build ties between countries. And one of the things that I hear in this is that there may be characteristics about U.S. companies viewing the Pakistani market that may make U.S. companies hesitant, but because there are attractive characteristics to the market, others may be less hesitant. The Chinese may be less hesitant, others in the region may be less hesitant. And I, I wonder to what extent the, the, either the panel has discussed or any of you would like to address the issue of sort of competition for the sort of economic hearts and minds of the Pakistani market. In other words, are, are, is, there, is there a likelihood that others will be building ties that will be strategically significant? This is kind of a counterpoint to the discussion that we heard earlier. And I, I just was wondering if anybody had a view on it. Well, a view is that um, uh, there's no question but that those Entities that are willing to accept lower returns will take, uh, you know, take a place at the table that uh, those who are expecting 15 to 20 percent after-tax rate of returns are not. So, uh, you know, the classic challenge we have competing with the Chinese in a whole lot of places, private sector as well as public sector, is they're accepting lower returns in many cases, not all, but in many cases, lower returns, and it's pretty tough to compete with that, uh, particularly. Uh, in the natural resource there. I think the fact that the Chinese aren't as big a presence in Pakistan is a fact is based upon the fact that they're that it's not as resource rich a country as some other places. Okay. Next. You always get the floor. Whenever what no, of course, whatever. Uh, one of the things um, that we suggest in the report, we have a list of possible a possible portfolio of areas where uh, US could put resources, investment resources, triggered or leveraged, catalyzed by aid. And one of them is the well-known Basha Dam issue. And we actually highlight that because we see it as 
a way to signal a long-term commitment because it would take five to ten years before any additional energy services or flood control is delivered. Um, so it would capture a little bit the idea that the U.S., by working with the government of Pakistan on, on that project, would be there for the long term. At the same time, we hear, including from inside the U.S. government, well, this is terribly risky, would investors come, uh, you know, it would require a lot of guarantees. So I'm just interested to hear from any or all of the panelists how that, dis that discussion and that decision, how what you're saying bears on what we see as a potentially important decision in the government of the U.S. It would have to include OPIC uh, and parts of USAID, and it would no doubt have to bring in IFC or the World Bank, et cetera, the Asian Development Bank. How do you see that? And would it help trigger, or would it tr there would be a trade-off in terms of the governance reforms that are needed to, um, in the long run, have all kinds of investments occurring. Sure, because this one is close to my heart. <laughs> this is an issue on which I uh, accuse uh, the Secretary of State when she was visiting Pakistan of uh, practicing carbon apartheid. Uh, <laughs> Pakistan is actually uh, resource rich. Uh, we have uh, the fifth largest coal reserves in the world, 175 billion tons of lignite. Uh, it's a dirty fuel. But more than 40% of U.S. power generation today, not in history, today comes from coal-based uh, power generation. And for the U.S. government to, to follow a policy which makes it extremely difficult, though hopefully not impossible because I think China is finally going to step in and fill that void, uh, for Pakistan to develop those coal reserves uh, is, is just the kind of issue uh, which undermines a lot of the effort that, that you're trying to make. Uh, similar to the, the, the issue of uh, textile uh, uh, access. Uh, maybe we find Pakistanis find it extremely amusing uh, that a country which does not have the political will to come up with creative ideas on how to deal with two senators uh, thinks that Pakistan should have the political will to, to rage a, uh, lead a full-scale civil war. Uh, and, and this, uh, what's the U.S. policy on the third coal reserve uh, is is exactly on the same lines. The, the World Bank, the IFC, we were working with them, uh, and, and it was moving along. And, and the moment the, the administration changed and the priorities changed, uh, I, I love Mr. Obama's commitment to a clean environment, uh, and I would love to uh, see him start to implement that in, in the U.S. today and by shutting down all the coal-based power generation units. Uh, and if you can't, because that's not practical, because that's too costly for a $45,000 per capita income economy, uh, then have a heart. An economy which is $900 per capita income uh, cannot be held to those standards. In the back, there was a question here. Yes, sir. Uh, my name is uh, Ijaz Nabi. I'm a professor of economics at the Lahore University of Management Sciences um, in Pakistan. Um, a question was raised here whether Pakistanis are paying enough, and I think that was answered very well by saying that this is not the right place to ask that question. But since the question was asked, Pakistan are paying uh, a lot of the costs, and it's called inflation tax. Uh, tax to GDP ratio, as we normally see it, may not be high, but as Masood understands, inflation tax is indeed very high. So Pakistanis do end up paying a lot of their own costs, but it's being done in a way which is very detrimental to the economy's growth. And that's where the IMF, et cetera, become relevant. The IMF is relevant also because so you're absolutely right. In, in the long term, a, a, it, it's, um, these, these short-term uh, measures don't help uh, a, a, from the long-term perspective, but uh, if, uh, if there isn't the next IMF tranche, uh, in six months' time, our reserves would not look the way they're looking today. Uh, there'd be enormous pressure on the rupee. Uh, and therefore, one cannot completely divorce the, the short term uh, from the long. I, you know, I think the greatest contribution that this report makes, it's a 40-page report, but it's a terrific report. It establishes in the minds of lots of people that Pakistan is not Fatah. 
I, for three years, I've been trying to fight that battle, trying to tell the audience in, in the United States that there's more to Pakistan than Fatah, and I think this report uh, does it extremely successfully. There are a couple of areas that this report highlights which I think uh, are worth pursuing. I think very early on, you say that uh, trade with India, and this is something that uh, Umar and I have been co-conspirators in, regional trade for Pakistan, that trade with India is going to be extremely important for Pakistan's economy, for indeed the South Asian economy going forward. Uh, but it did not elaborate at all uh, in the rest of the report. It would be good to, to get some understanding of what kind of leverage there can be uh, on this issue uh, going forward. And also, finally, I think, uh, I think there is a huge audience for this report in Pakistan, the governance issue that everybody talks about, the expectations that Pakistani elite have from uh, external donors, and how those expectations can be grounded in some very sensible suggestions made in this report, is a message that needs to be discussed with the Pakistani elite as well. Thank you. Would anybody like to respond to either of those? No one would like to respond. I'll that. agree. <laughs> no, everybody agrees. So there, there, there you have it. Uh, yes, sir. Mark Stucker with the Overseas Private Investment Corporation. Appreciate your remarks, Rob. And thank you very much, Nancy, for hosting this event and all the events that the Center for Global Development does. Really a terrific force for development. Uh, we are open for... Uh, mitigating political risk in Pakistan. So I bought a whole pocket full of business cards. If, you, if you're a U.S. investor, by statute, we're required to have a U.S. investment to back, but we are certainly open to listening, and we may be able to help. Question, how can we develop, how can we assist Pakistan to attract more foreign direct investment? If you look at the totals for China versus other countries. I mean, China is getting an enormous amount of foreign direct investment. What, is, what can Pakistan do? What, what, what in the United States can we do to assist Pakistan to attract more investment? Uh, it'll go back to the same thing. I mean, uh, Pakistan needs to get its own house in order. If, if we do the simple reforms that are needed, uh, it will open uh, Pakistan up uh, and, and for the foreigners to find enormous opportunities. And, and really, that's where uh, the, the U.S. or any foreign role comes in, uh, expanding the, the sizes of the uh, funds available with, uh, with people like o OPIC uh, would, would be a great way of facilitating those investments. Uh, but at this point in time, uh, if, if the total potential is 100, only 10 of that maybe is not getting used because uh, political risk insurance is not available or, or, or the right instruments are not available, and, and 90 because the right reform package. Uh, I mean, just look at the sector, energy sector alone. Uh, energy can absorb something between, uh, I would suspect, comfortably, two to three billion dollars a year for the next 10 years, comfortably. Uh, and, and it's not even getting $200 million, and, and it's because of, uh, of uh, the kind of issues that were being referred to earlier. Uh, so really the ball is in Pakistan's court, and, uh, and, and, and Dr. Saab, I don't want Pakistan's foreign exchange reserves to be run down, uh, and therefore I want us to adopt the reforms that, that should be front-ended uh, before the funding comes in. Uh, I, I want the capital flows to come into the country, preferably of foreign investors and, and, and equity investors, uh, and, uh, ra rather than uh, through debt. Uh, but but even the, de the debt would be welcome. But based on commercial considerations, uh, on the back of a domestic homegrown reform agenda, which has the backing of the civil society of Pakistan, business, private sector, uh, and, and the, the political consensus behind that. That's really the way to go. I would just add to that that I think, uh, and we say this in the report, Mark, but we need to, the United States government and the United States in general can support the reformers more aggressively and uh, do what we can to enable them to succeed. And we actually think that providing uh, greater access to the U.S. market, which looks like a sacrificial thing to some, doesn't, doesn't hit everybody as that sacrificial, uh, would be the sort of thing that would enable us to, to uh, support the reformers and say to them, We've taken some steps. I hope you take some steps. 
Okay, there, there's a question in the second row first. Assalamualaikum. My name is Sabah Ahmed, and I'm a lobbyist here at Capitol Hill. I wanted to find out, this is a question for uh, Dr. Um, Asad. Um, we would like to find out how can Pakistani Americans here in the United States help Pakistan uh, with the policy level discussions here in Washington, D.C.? Actually, not very well placed to answer that question uh, because I, I, I don't know the U.S. policy scene very well. Uh, there is a lot, there is a very strong feeling in Pakistan that Pakistan is not a very well understood country in, in, in the U.S., uh, that it's a misunderstood country. Uh, I think. Prima facie, from far away, uh, there seems to be some uh, some truth in that, and 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 therefore any report uh, or any discourse, uh, any dialogue which helps improve that understanding is a step in the right direction. And and when I say better understanding, I'm not necessarily saying presenting a pretty picture. Uh, and I, I think the kind of hard nose uh, approach, uh, very very uh, pragmatic, very honest uh, that that you see in the report that we are just discussing right now. Uh, this is just the kind of thing that, that needs to happen more often. Okay, we've got about 10 minutes. I've seen three or four hands, so I'm going to go in the order that I saw them. So first here, and then I'll go to you, and then you, and then you. Yes, sir. Uh, my name is Jim Bernstein. Uh, I'm with an organization called Walkabout Development Solutions. We're, we are actually attempting to do entrepreneurship in northern Pakistan. Uh, and I have um, no comments, just a few questions. Uh, question number one is I've heard nobody today speak about the fact that Pakistan is running out of water. Water tables are dropping. Bulk of the water that comes into the country escapes to the sea. The population is growing. It'll be close to 200 million people before too much longer. And today there's not enough water. So I would take exception with energy without water. All of you gentlemen have a nice fresh bottle of water in front of you. A human cannot live more than three days without water. So I think that's a big problem. Second thing is I wonder, I truly wonder every day when I hear language being used, which if I were a Pakistani, I would be uncomfortable with it. Why is the US donating or assisting or aiding we think of U.S. tax dollars as possibly being an investment, just like we invested in General Motors or the banks. Why are we not investing in other countries? And I would ask you gentlemen to please compare the way the U.S. provides what you call assistance and the way the Chinese do it. So those are a few issues. Now, the last point is that as an entrepreneur, uh, equity investment is critical. In this country, because high-risk investments are difficult to make, there are subsidies for people who take high-risk investments. So my question to USAID indirectly would be, why are you not spending some of your millions of dollars to provide subsidy for equity investments in Pakistan? Okay, hold your fire here. I've just been handed a note saying that we must wrap up now in five minutes. Um, there's still four questions, so I'm going to go to the four question, the three other questioners quickly and ask you for 30 seconds. Questions usually end with an inflection upward at the end, uh, just in case some of you have missed that. Um, and, and then you guys can answer whichever ones that you, uh, you, you feel. You, each of you will be given a, a, you know, 35, 40 seconds to wrap up then at the end. Hi, uh, Adil Kabani with the uh, Overseas Private Investment Corporation. Really good to be here with my former boss, and uh, good work on the on the report. Uh, I haven't heard anything about the recent floods that devastated Pakistan and the conditions on the ground post floods that um, you know are currently taking place. And you know, what are the public institutions in Pakistan uh, doing to support the reconstruction efforts? What is the U.S. government doing to support the reconstruction efforts? And 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 Robert, what what more could OPEC do? Okay, that's the question. So first question: too little water. Second question. Too much water. <laughs> now, 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 what, there was, was there was one more. Wait, you, you, you were one more question here. I'll make my comment actually as a question by saying why not or why don't we realize uh, it's Elliot Tepper again from Carleton University. Uh, I'm also a member of the Canada Pakistan Business Council, and I've had the pleasure of taking a uh, business tour 
uh, going with businessmen to, to uh, Pakistan, and it opens up your eyes. I'd like to begin with a comment uh, made we earlier really, by Nancy. We really only yes, have three it's, a, it's a quick one. Entrepreneurship has been mentioned. Why don't we realize that entrepreneurship, along with philanthropy, is a hallmark of some of the human resources there? It's vibrant. It needs the right uh, enabling devices. Second, why don't we realize the close link between economic growth and democratic growth and uh, the whole relationship between a good job and a good future? I think there's been far too, relate, too little of a linking of the economic dimension with the future of Pakistan. Thirdly, why don't we realize that the opening up of the field to China, uh, giving it a free run, is a cost to the West in general? Uh, I would put that more broadly. Why don't we realize there's a link between geopolitics and economics in Pakistan? Thank you, for prof Professor, for the lesson in rhetorical questions. <laughs> for perhaps perhaps a non-rhetorical question here, and then we'll turn to the panel. <laughs> Thank you, David. Uh, Gary Kleiman, uh, Nancy and her team were kind enough to allow me to include some content, I think, for the first time. I think I've seen in aid recommendations on portfolio investment and the importance of engaging uh, private creditors and portfolio managers as part of this process. But I wanted to ask a specific question in that regard. We all know Pakistan would have defaulted had not the IMF uh, come to its rescue two years ago. And many who are looking at the situation argue that without the uh, IMF tranche renewed and because the IMF money has to be repaid, we could be in that situation of sovereign default again. And I wonder how that colors some of the recommendations and advice uh, you and the panel uh, have given so far. OK. Each one of you gets a minute to wrap up here. Is that OK? Is a minute OK for you? Sorry. Two. I'll take less than a minute. I have two points. Both medium term. I think water is the really big medium term issue that we still are not grappling with in Pakistan. It's going to have a much bigger impact on 30 years out from now than much of what we're talking about. And the second one, which we haven't talked about very much, at least in this panel, is education. And if you look at it every year, one and a half million kids out of the four million that come into the school age in Pakistan, one and a half million don't go to school. And every year you're adding a one and a half million kids to the unschooled grouping. One out of every 10 kids out of school in, Pakistan, in the world is in Pakistan. So if we don't grapple with that, then next generation is the same set of issues that we're dealing with this generation. So I'd say if you want to focus medium term, water and education are going to be the two big drivers. Excellent point. Rob. Just to acknowledge that water is not only a critical issue, it was an issue that was uh, talked about by the panel, uh, but it was also a sector in which reforms were absolutely essential to facilitate development uh, along uh, different uh, points of different water streams. So that's not to ignore it, it's critical. Um, second, uh, I, I just want to touch on the question about USAID and equity. In general, I'd say the United States government does not do a good job of, of uh, investing equity. Uh, in things. I mean, there are uh, exceptions. Uh, enterprise funds uh, worked in a couple of places in Europe, uh, and I think they're being talked about for Afghanistan, Pakistan, uh, and, and Egypt and elsewhere. Uh, but very, very important that you have majority private sector management of those and not turn it over to bureaucrats, um, and which I was once. Uh, in terms of the floods, I can't uh, speak to how much Work has been done since. I know, uh, though, that uh, it was a huge attraction for resources, uh, but insignificant relative to the size of the damage, which was just overwhelming. Um, and finally, uh, I, I think the whole point of what we were trying to say by the sustainability of uh, private sector economic growth and the creation of a middle class is uh, good jobs do mean a brighter future. And being able to put food on the table is one of the essential things that if we can uh, enable that, uh, we will do more to stabilize the country than most military investments we could make. Okay. Sad. The last word. Uh, on, on water, uh, it's a huge issue. Uh, I will not go into the details, but the way it is being used is actually a bigger problem at this point in time uh, rather than actually shortage of water. John Briscoe out of Harvard is working with the, with the Punjab government. I, I'm involved in that a little bit also in, in trying to come up with a policy which deals with a lot of the water-related issues. So there is work going on in that area. Uh, on the floods, uh, the private uh, 
the, the damage that was caused uh, was mitigated to a certain extent because it was primarily the rural communities which got affected and the commodity boom that we have had, uh, particularly with cotton prices, because it was mainly the cotton area which got devastated. Uh, there's been tremendous uh, inflow of, of money in that in those areas, uh, but the public infrastructure was damaged extremely badly and extensively. And with the kind of fiscal pressures that the, the government has been facing, uh, not much work has been done there. So there's a lot of work that still needs to be done in the area of public infrastructure. Um, so, all right, thank you very much. I am going to set aside the moderator's traditional responsibility of summing things up, and I'm going to leave that to the organizers of the conference because I see Ambassador Haqqani is here. And you want to move on to this next stage. But before we get to the ambassador, please join me in thanking this panel for an excellent discussion. <laughs>